Good morning. Welcome to Connect Church. Hey, let's thank our team for leading us out today. Man, we are so grateful that you are here, and man, we love singing the gospel and uh, and making much of Jesus together, doing everything we can to connect everyone we can with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are grateful that you are here. I'm going to tell you, last Sunday was incredible on the riverbanks there, and, and uh, hundreds of you came out, baptizing 36 people, helping them take their next step of faith. Isn't that good stuff? Man, I, I love it. Today... Uh, One of the most pressing questions um, asked by Christians is simply this, how do I know God's will for my life? It's a question that was posed to us in this series, how do I know God's will for my life? This is a good question for those who ask it both sincerely and approach it willingly, willing to do whatever it takes to know and to obey the very will of God for your life. Uh, You know, oftentimes the will of God is thrown out there, and and surely it means more than what we make it out uh, to be. For instance, you know, I'm fixing to go home and have lunch. Surely God's will is, hey, God, uh, which Dorito bag should I finish off today, right? Hey, real quick, here's what I need to know. How many of you guys are ranch Dorito people out in the crowd? Can you raise your hand? Hey, Hey, listen, ranch people, how about that one chip that's got all the spices on it? Like God favored that one chip in the whole bag, and it's yours, right? How many nacho cheese Dorito folks are there? I love it. Hey, listen, let me tell you God's answer to should I finish off a bag of Doritos today. The answer to that is no. Have you ever lit one of these on fire at a campfire? Have you ever seen the green flame it produces? It is awesome in a campfire. Really probably not good for your body. So anyway, maybe God's will is more than what kind of Doritos am I going to finish off today for lunch? For me, it's on Sunday morning going, hey, God, is it your will for me to to wear this black shirt or maybe this black shirt or I like this black shirt, right? Maybe it's more than just wearing this black shirt on on a Sunday morning to preach. Hey, listen, maybe God's will is more than that. The question of God's will often comes at milestones in our lives. We seek God's will uh, for what college we will uh, attend, what career should we pursue. Is it God's will for me to date her? Is it God's will for me to marry this person? Should I move out of town to this other city, or, or maybe should I change career fields? Now, while many people ask the question of God's will for their life, few people actually put in the work of uncovering, of discovering the work of what it is to position themselves to know and to understand, to discern the will of God. Few people put themselves in that position. Hey, can I remind you something today uniquely? That God cares about who you date. He cares about who you marry. He cares about what school you go to, the career you choose. He cares about your marriage, your kids, your grandkids, where and that you go to church. He cares uh, about what you do with your, your money, your resources, your time, how you run your business. He cares about your work ethic. He cares about it all, and because he is God, he has a say in it all. You see, what is God's will for my life? This past week, my girls uh, learned how to make homemade biscuits. Thank God. And so, listen, there's several kind of biscuits available at the house. Now, I'm just going to put this out there. The best biscuits on the planet are at Cracker Barrel, and you just can't go there every day. At least that's what my wife says. And so we've learned what kind of to do with biscuits at the house, and there's really three types of biscuits you have. You have homemade biscuits, which are the best by far. You just can't beat homemade biscuits. I mean, I love it. My girls will learn how to make that. But then you have canned biscuits. You know what this is? This is dinner and a show because you know what you have to do to this can? You have to risk your very life to pop it open, right? And you don't know what's going to happen after this. So we have canned biscuits at the house. Um, They're pretty fun. But then there's the easiest biscuits of all, and that is the bag biscuits. You know, you you just buy them in a bag, open the bag, throw them. You don't even have to risk your life. Like with the canned biscuits, you just put these biscuits in the oven, and then they cook. Uh, Listen, the, the canned biscuits and the bag biscuits, they don't take a whole lot of work. But for the good biscuits, for the best biscuits, you got to roll up your sleeves. Got to get your hands dirty. You got to invest some time and energy, some resources into it. But at the end of the day, what you have, that finished product, and it's the absolute best. Did you know the same is true with knowing the will of God for your life? 
There's no easy way to it. It takes rolling up your sleeves and putting in some work. It takes positioning yourself to know the very will of God for your life. So today, we're going to roll up the sleeves. Today, we get to work. I love what Paul writes to the Colossian church um, in Colossians chapter 1, beginning of verse 9. From the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I love that. His will, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the very knowledge of God. I love this passage because it reminds us that not only is God's will knowable, something that we could know in our lives, but that you and I can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord by following through his will. Following him in his will, we can live a life that is worthy to him. But how do we position ourselves to know the will of God for our lives? Uh, so one of my side hustles, if you will, is I get to do a lot of weddings. In fact, I've married uh, several of you in here today. Um, I, I get to do a lot of weddings on the side, and I love it. Uh, one of the things that I always do is when it's wedding day, and I'm standing down there with the groom, and we're waiting on the bride, is I'll kind of take a look at the venue, and I'll kind of take a look at where the crowd is positioned. And one of the things I'll always do to the groom is say, hey, buddy, look, as soon as she starts coming, they start playing her song. Position yourself to where you can see your bride. Don't let anyone, don't let anything obstruct your view to your bride. And so me and him right there in front of everybody, so I tell everybody to stand up in her music place, but we kind of position him to see his bride so nothing blocks his view. You know, today what we want to do through the Word of God is to position you to see and to know and to understand and to discern the will of God in your life, to let no one, to let nothing obstruct your view of the very will of God that he has for your life. So how do we position ourselves there? I'm going to give you six things today. Number one, we must be biblically literate. Hey, for you and I to position ourselves to know and to understand and to discern the word of God, we have to be biblically literate. That means this, to love and to labor in the very word of God day in and day out in our lives. I love the psalmist. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. And I I wonder why maybe that so many Christians are walking in this darkness, this uncertainty to the will of God in their life. It's because they've not taken up their flashlight. They've not turned on the lamp. That is the very word of God. We must be biblically literate. Sometimes I think we really do want to know the will of God for our lives, but we want it to come easy. We want it to be clicking on a YouTube video to figure it out. But we we want it to be like what would happen, so I help my kids with their math homework some, and I cannot tell you the amount of times my daughter will go, hey, Dad, how do you solve this problem? Baby, that's so easy. Hey, Siri. What is 33 to 34? It, hey, it, we, we want a Siri answer to the will of God in our lives. We don't want to put in the work, the discipline of reading, knowing, memorizing, and applying Scripture to our lives. Knowing all the well that God has written, God has spelled out His will in His Word. That we have access to it, and we can know His will simply by reading it, studying it and memorizing the Word of God. You might say, well, I want an easier way. If God could just audibly, with his voice, go, this is my will for your life, then I listen, I would know God's will, and I would follow God's will. But here's the question I have for you. Why are you after voices when you have verses? He might be sitting there today and say, listen, if I could just have a sign from God, a sign from the heavens that this is his will and this is where I should go, then I would believe and follow the will of God. Hey, why are you looking for signs when he's given you scriptures? We must be biblically literate, position ourselves to know the will of God in our life. There's no way around it. It is impossible for you and me to know the will of God as believers without the Word of God. But not only must we be biblically literate and position ourselves that way, we must be Spirit-led. I love this in John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, watch this, He will guide you into all the truth. This is Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit, meaning this being Spirit-led, 
means that Jesus has saved you. He has put his spirit inside of you. And that spirit, that Holy Spirit is our helper, according to John 14, 16. Now, you might say this. No, listen, Anthony. I, I was raised in church. I know my Bible. Why is it that Moses had a burning bush to help him with God's will, and all I get is heartburn when I try to figure out God's will for my life? Where's my burning bush? How about old Gideon? All his fleeces, and all I have is faith. Where's my, where's my fleeces? Even Moses had a pillar of fire by night to lead him and FaceTime privileges with God. And you're telling me all I have is my Bible and i got prayer? Where's my pillar? Even Elijah had that still small voice of God, and I can't seem to quiet the voices in my head when it comes to the will of God. Joshua, you stood the sun still in the sky for him. And all I have is your spirit. Oh, believer, you have something far greater than in you than just a, a burning bush. Something far more consequential than some fleece. You have faith. The author of Hebrew reminds us in Hebrews eleven six. 6. Now watch this preaching. You ready? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hey, you don't need a pillar of fire by night, church, because in Christ you have resurrection power in you. More than a still small voice, you have scriptures that are shouting loudly into your life if you will unleash them. More than a sun standing still, you have the Son of the Most High God alive and moving in you through His Holy Spirit. Hear me, you have all you need in the Holy Spirit who resides in you by faith to know and understand and to discern the will of God. Perhaps a better question for us today is not what is God's will for my life, and as I've said before, but what is, where is the Holy Spirit leading me in the next five minutes of my life? Ami Ayalon, a former commander of the Israeli forces, said this to NPR, I loved it. He said this, when a captain is without direction, no wind on earth will take him there. He has no place to go. So today we set our direction towards the very will of God through Christ Jesus in our life. And we let the Holy Spirit, the, the wind of God, take us there. Not only must we be biblically literate, position ourselves that way to know the will of God. Not only ought we be spirit-led, but we must be kingdom driven. Matthew 6, and I love this passage, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. We must be kingdom minded, seeking God's glory, not our own. Meaning we are busy building his kingdom and not just our own little castles. It means positioning ourselves in obedience to his word and trusting him with everything else. The, all these things in Matthew 6, We position ourselves to know the will of God for our lives when you and I are kingdom driven. But we also must be situationally aware. We position ourselves. We've got to be situationally aware. I, I love what John Piper says. He says this, that God is always doing 10,000 things in your life and you might just be aware of three of them. That God is at work not only in you, but around you. That God is at work for his glory and our good and the good of other people. We're reminded of that by Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It's, it's an idea that you and I need to be on the lookout for God and his work around us, not just in us. Henry Blackaby wrote a great study called Experiencing God. And in that study, speaking of the will of God in our lives, he said this, watch to see where God is working and join him. Join him there. Watch to see where God is working and join him. Join God where he's working. It's asking the question, how is God not only moving in me but around me? Through the people in my life, through my passions, what we're good at through situations and circumstances, even the tough ones. Hey, can I remind you that there is no such thing as panic in heaven, for God has no problems. He only has plans for his people. Hey, there also are no coincidences when it comes to a sovereign God and his will. Even when you cannot see it, God is orchestrating history for his glory 
and for the good of not only us, but for the good of those who love him as well. As well. You and I must be situationally aware, position ourselves in such a way to know and understand and discern the will of God for our lives. Hey, here's another one. You ready? How do we position ourselves to know the will of God? And that is we must be prayer-fueled. Watch this in 1 John chapter 5. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. We must be prayer-fueled. Let me ask you this. How much of your life and the decisions of your life have you committed to prayer? More than just rub-a-dub-dub, thank you for the grub kind of deal but invested time in prayer. For prayer does not bend God's will towards ours. Rather, prayer is the bending of our will towards his. Prayer says to God, I cannot do this on my own. I need you. I want you in on this decision. And you know what? I'm not going anywhere without you. Prayer fuels the will of God and our position to know it, to understand it, and to discern it. Last about positioning. Hey, remember, this whole conversation is about rolling up our sleeves, not, not opting out for the easy, but finding ourselves doing the work we need to to understand and know the will of God. And here's the last thing. We position ourselves by inviting others to the table. I love this in Proverbs 11.4. It says this, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. It's the idea of inviting people to the table, and hear me, not yes people, but Jesus people. Not people are just going to say yes to everything, but Jesus people, those who have biblical wisdom, those who walk with Jesus and who are led by the Spirit, those who are willing to love you enough to sit at your table and to give you an answer that you're not wanting to hear. Because they love you and they love Jesus enough to speak into your life. And oftentimes the reason we miss God's will for our life is because we're inviting fools to sit at the table. We're inviting yes people to sit there. And that's where Jesus' people belong. I love this in Proverbs 1.5. That a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Church, before we can know and understand and discern the will of God, We must roll up our sleeves and best position ourselves to do just that, to know and to understand and discern his will. But we do so by being biblically literate, uh, laboring and loving the word of God. But we do that by being spirit-led, kingdom-driven, situationally aware of where God is at work around us, prayer-fueled, and by inviting Jesus' people to sit at our table and to speak into our very lives. Oh, when it comes to discerning God's will, years ago, many years ago, Rick Warren uh, came out with several tests uh, to test your decisions and your direction uh, when it comes to the will of God. I thought these were very good. I've adapted them uh, over the years. But hey, can we talk about some tests we can apply uh, to some of the decisions that we're making in our everyday lives and some of the big decisions, the small decisions, and this pursuit for you and I Uh, to know and to understand and discern the will of God. Um, Here's the first test, and that is the ideal test. Is this decision I'm making, is it in harmony with the word of God? Well, watch this, because we're reminded in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, by the way, which belongs with God's will. One of the tests we need to put our decisions through is simply this. Does it align with the Word of God? It's the ideal test. There's another test we we put, and that is the integrity test. I love this in Proverbs 10, 9. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. The integrity test. Will this decision bring glory to God? Will it honor my family? my church family, my friends, and my community. Man, if you can say yes to that, man, you're on track to a decision that might very well be God's will for your life. Does it pass the integrity test? And then we have the improvement test. That's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Watch what Paul writes. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have a right to do anything, but not everything 
is constructive. The improvement test is this. Will this build me up in Christ or will it tear me from him? Will this better my relationship with him? Will this make me a better disciple? That's the, that's the improvement test. Is your decision past that? Now, I love this. There's the independence test. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul would reiterate, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. It's the independence test. Could this decision become addicting and controlling and, and dominate my life? Will this decision lead to workaholism, alcoholism, gaming, addiction? Well, this, could this decision lead me into social media addiction or any other aholic or addiction in between? Can you say of this decision, I will not be mastered by it, and I can still know and love and follow after Jesus, the independence test. And then there's the influence test. I love this in Romans 14, 13. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. The influence test asks this question, will this decision hurt others? Will this decision hurt others in the process? And the influence test is an important one. You know, i got to think of this. You know, Aaron and I came over and planted Connect Church years ago, five years ago almost six years ago now, we had nothing, and uh, we just came over here just following what we believe to be God's will, and as we applied every test and positioned ourselves every way we could, and uh, one of the things that I wrestled with the most is, is this going to hurt my family? Is this going to hurt my relationship with my wife? How about with my kids? Financially, we, we don't have anything. What, what, what do we do here, and and ultimately, we found fit that this would bless my family. No matter what would happen, that we knew God was in it, that God would bless it. It's such a hard decision, but it passed the influence test for my family. The last test I want to mention, and that is the investment test. Meaning this, is this decision, is this direction, is it the best use of my time and will it be the best use of my life? Is it the best use of my time and my talent and my treasure? Watch what Paul would write, the Ephesus church in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Man, is this decision, this direction in your life? Does it pass the investment test? Is it worthy, not only of your time and your talent and your treasure, is it worthy of the gospel in your life? Will it pass the test? Hey, church, so far I've given you six ways to position yourself in the very will of God. I've given you multiple tests that you can apply to the direction, the decisions of your life, trying to discern the will of God. But can I give you one truth? The very will of God in your life is more than just a pursuit. It's a person. The will of God and its culmination in your life is more than just a pursuit of a direction or answers or, or anything. And it's more about a person by the name of Jesus and so oftentimes when this question comes, there's a verse I, I run to, and in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And watch this, acknowledge him, acknowledge him, and watch this, in all your ways, and he'll keep straight your path. You see, this reminds us that the will of God is more about a person than it is even the pursuits of our life. And so we trust him with it. With all of our hearts, everything we are. We lean not on our own understandings in all our ways. We, we acknowledge Him. And those paths that we are walking, He will make them straight. It's the promise that He gives us. I, I love this lady. Her name's Elizabeth Elliot. It's considered one of the most influential Christian women of the 20th century. She's wife to a martyred missionary by the name of Jim Elliot. And after his death, she went to serve and take the gospel to the very tribe that killed her husband. 
Later, she remarried. But she tragically lost her second husband, and the last days of Elizabeth Elliot's life were spent in the ravages of dementia of her mind. But before she died, and listen, she would write many books and host many radio shows and have an influence on the masses. Before she died, she simply wrote this, God is God. And because he is God, he is worthy of my trust and obedience. Listen to what she writes. I will find rest nowhere but in his holy will that is unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. God's will is even bigger than our ability to comprehend all the times, and that's okay. Because we trust and we obey him. And we trust him with it all. There's a verse in Jeremiah that uh, I know many of you were hoping I would quote in this sermon. I'm going to. Jeremiah 29, 11, Understanding this promise is not necessarily for the church. This is for God's covenant people in the Old Testament. Um, this is a promise he made to them in time. But here's what it does do. It does reveal to us the very heart of God for his people. And listen, this verse is no more realized at a greater extent than by looking to what we have in Christ. But listen to God's promises to his people. He said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And so understand this, as we pursue the will of God through the person of Christ today, we realize this, that God has plans for us, plans to prosper us. Now, careful here, American. Careful here, American church. All we're going to think about sometimes when we see that word is our financial bank accounts. And I'm going to tell you something. There is more that God can prosper in life than just our finances. And by the way, sometimes he does just that in our finances. Hey, but can I remind you there are some things money can't buy, and God prospers us there as well. In his will, we have plans to prosper, not to destroy us. Watch these plans in God's will that lead us to both a hope and a future. And can I tell you something? When I read this verse in the Old Testament, you know who I cannot help but think of of the New Testament? That's Jesus. That's the promise I have in him. The very will of God in my life. Now, i got to throw out a warning before we close today. In this conversation of the will of God, we must be careful not to use the language of God's will to manipulate people to get our way. Man, I have seen this more times than not. I've seen it happen. Be careful, because when you put God's name on it in order to manipulate others to get your way, and God's will has nothing to do with what you are saying, watch this, you are bearing false witness against God himself. You fall into the category of a false witness prophet and you're inviting the very punishment of God into your life. Let me, ex- let me give you an example of this. And this has happened. A guy walks into my office. He got caught. He's cheating on his wife. And man, you know what he'll say? He'll go, you know what? Listen, I know that's sin. But I'm going to divorce my wife and I'm going to marry my girlfriend because that's God's will in my life. And she's my soulmate. There's a biblical way to answer that. And then there's my fleshly way of answering that. Man, I just want to knock him upside the head. What are, are, you, even, are you even hearing yourself? I, I want you to know this, that you have the freedom to put God's name on whatever you want, to manipulate whoever you want to manipulate, and to get things your way. But you are inviting the punishment of God into your life. Because here's what we know, you ready? The will of God will never lead us to sin against that very same God. It will never lead us into a direction where you and I would go contradictory to the word of God. And so can I just, can I encourage you to be very careful? Hey, hey listen, we're six years into Connect Church. I'm just now getting comfortable saying this is God's will for Aaron and I. On the very front end, and for years in the Connect Church, I'd go, listen, we've done everything we could to seek God, and we believe he's leading here. We're just very careful because 
I don't want to use God's will to manipulate or to control anybody. I can put God's name on his word. I can put God's name on his promises. But I'm very slow to put God's name until I know for sure how he bears fruit and the Holy Spirit moves, that God is at work. So be careful when you use the language of God's will. Know that it is his will. Now, to the believer, far too many Christians... When it comes to the question of God's will in their life, they find this question crippling. And it shouldn't be. It should be the most empowering pursuit of the Christian life. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, that pastor theologian, that Nazi dissidence once said this, and I love it. He said, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing the will of God. Hey, when was the last time that you could say of your pursuit of the will of God in your life that you are actively and courageously pursuing the will of God for your life? Now, just so you know, he is not downplaying the effects of sin. But let me tell you what I know to be true, that in the seasons of my life that I'm actively and courageously pursuing the will of God, sin fades into the background. Sin is less and less of a struggle. When was the last time you could say, I have actively, courageously pursued the will of God and done the will of God in my life? I'm telling you, it's empowering. Henry Martin, speaking of the will of God, said this, I am immortal until God's work for me to do is done. I am immortal. I am invincible. Hey, can't touch this until the will and the work of God is done in my life. Guys, I want you to hear me. That is empowering. No matter the situation and circumstance you face today, knowing that you find yourself not only in the will of God, but doing the will of God, and you cannot be touched until his work and his will is done for your life. That ought to make us feel like we could absolutely rush the gates of hell this morning and not have one fear here. The will of God is empowering in the Christian life. I want to do this, again, six ways to position yourself to to know the will of God. Test after test to apply to your decisions and the direction in your life. And and can I give you the best that I have right here? Anthony, what what can I take home today that's going to help me to know and understand, to discern, to follow the will of God in my life? I go back to a garden called Gethsemane. I go to Jesus on the eve of his crucifixion as the weight of what is fixing to happen in just mere hours, that the wrath of God against my sin and your sin will be on his son Jesus as he's on the cross. And Jesus speaks of that cup of wrath and says, Father, if there's any other way. And then Jesus offers one simple prayer, not my will. That yours be done. Can I tell you what a win from today would be? Every believer leaving this room today, going back into your marriages, in your home, your friendships, your relationships, your work relationships, your school relationships, with one prayer on your very heart and lips, and that is not my will, but yours be done. Hey, how many marriages could that one prayer save in this room? How many kids can that one prayer save? How many relationships, how much hurt and pain and scars of sin could be saved by a believer praying in there every day? Not my will, but yours be done. That is the prayer that we learn from Jesus that not only positions us, but will bless us with the very knowledge of the will of God for my life, in your dating life, your marriage, and every relationship you have, your relationship with your money and your stuff. I'm going to tell you this. Your marriage, your home, your relationships, your workplaces, your business, your school would never be the same if you walked out of this room today and made it the prayer of your heart, the very prayer of your lips, each and every day this week, Father, not my will, but yours be done. 
not my will, but yours. Uh, this is Father Damien. Two years ago, I shared part of his story in a sermon, which I'm sure all of you remember. Um, but um, Father Damien, a Belgian priest who would give his life to serving what is considered a God-forsaken place and people, the island of Molokai, where Hawaiians sent those with leprosy or Hansen's disease. That's where they were quarantined and separated from their families and their friends. Damien, in his life, decided he would go to this island. For 12 years, he served the people there with leprosy. He brought to them the gospel that even though the Hawaiian people no longer loved them, God did. He brought not only the gospel, but he shared food with them. He cooked for them. He cared for them. He he tended to their sores that the leprosy brought. And after 12 years of service, he contracted leprosy. And four years later, he died. Towards the end of his life, Damien wrote a letter to his brother back on the shores of America, and he said this, I am gently going to my grave. It is the will of God. And I thank him very much for letting me die of the same disease and in the same way as my lepers. He said, brother, I'm very happy and I'm very satisfied. You and I get to thinking, what? Where is this God? Why me? Look at what I've done. Why me? Mentality. And then you realize, how is it that he can write a letter that says, I am very happy and I'm satisfied and I'm thankful that I have leprosy and I can die the same way as my lepers. How can you do that? Because at some point in Damien's life, he said, God, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. It's hard to find a millionaire on their deathbed who could write the same letter with all the comforts of this life and to say, I'm very happy and very satisfied. But Damien, a man who had nothing, gave everything, was able to write that because at some point in his life and then every day for the rest of his life with those lepers, he said, God, not my will, but yours be done. Let's pray together, can we? And as we, uh, as we pray together, believer, I, I don't know where this message hits you today. That's the thing about messages like this, man. I, I throw it out there, and it's going to work a thousand different ways across every person who came to a service today or, or watched online. I don't know where this hits you today, but I do know this, that God desires every single one of us to leave this place in obedience to his word and his will. God desires in every one of us to pray the prayer of his son Jesus. Father, not my will, but your will be done in my life. And listen, yes, we've got to position ourselves to know and to discern, to understand the will of God. Now, we've got to be biblically literate. We must be spirit-led. We have to be kingdom-driven. We've got to be situationally aware. We've got to be prayer-fueled. And we've got to invite Jesus' people to the table. We need to put our direction and our decisions through those various tests. But at the end of the day, the will of God for your life and mine is not just a pursuit, but a person by the name of Jesus. And it looks like waking up every morning And looking in that mirror and going, Father, not my will, but yours be done. We have to do it on purpose. It just doesn't happen. At no point in anybody's week this past week did an angel come down from heaven and say that for you. Oh, the difference in your marriage and your relationships and your work and your school. If you woke up every day and said, not my will, but yours be done. And so I wonder this. I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit is is illuminating and working on so many believers' hearts right now. 
that there may be some struggles or some shortfalls when it comes to desiring the will of God for your life, that maybe you've not been courageously and actively pursuing His will. And so right now, as the Holy Spirit lays that bear before you, I wonder if you just simply, in all of those areas of your life, just right now speak that prayer that Jesus prayed over it and say, Father, in that area, not my will but yours be done. And as believers are praying, man, I can't help but to turn my mind to those who today are living without Jesus. And there are those of you in this service, there have been in every other service, who are living without Jesus. So can I, can I give you another warning before we go? That if you are here and you are seeking God's will for your life without a relationship with Jesus, you're seeking God's will for your life, trying to bypass faith and following of Jesus, can I share with you some hard news? You will never find God's will for your life. You'll never find it. For God's will for your life right now in this moment is for you to place your faith and trust in Jesus, the 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 teaches that today is the day of salvation for you. That God's will is 2 Peter 3, 9 is that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And for those today who are living without Jesus, there's a choice you make. Either God's will for your life now or it's God's wrath forever. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross to empty the grave so that through his death and resurrection you might have life. It is God's will for you today to be saved. And if that's you, to cry out right now from your heart to his is prayer. Hey, listen, a prayer doesn't save anyone. It's the act of placing your faith and trust in Jesus that does. But to cry this out from your heart to his, dear Jesus, I, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Please save me. I place my faith and my trust in you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for rising again. I give you my life. Would you help me turn from my sin and myself? Jesus, I am yours. And without anybody looking. Man, I wonder in this service, who just prayed with me? I won't embarrass you and I won't come to you, but, but if you prayed that with me, I want the great honor today just to pray for you. Even if I don't know your name, man, I'm going to pray for your face. I want to pray for you. I won't embarrass you or come to you, but if you prayed that with me, Hey, would you just look up here for a moment? Hey, make eye contact with me. I, I, want, to, I want to see your eyes. Pastor, I, I prayed that with you. I see you, buddy. Somebody else, it's me. Pastor, I, I prayed that with you today. Ma'am, I see you. Thank you for looking up. Somebody else, ma'am, I see you. Amen, I see you. Somebody else, it's me. Sir, I see you. Sir, I see you. Just another moment. I prayed that with you, Pastor Anthony. I asked Jesus to save me. I see you, man. I see you. I see you guys. Promise me something. You let me say no, okay? You let me say no, right? Awesome. That's me, Pastor. Just one more moment as I look over the whole room. Just takes me just another moment. Pastor, that's me. And how we celebrate what God has done in your life. For everybody who looked up at me, hey, there's a number on the screen that you can text. Just your first name. We're going to call and celebrate with you this week. We got some resources. Hey, a better next step than that is stopping by the Next Steps tent out in the lobby. We'd love to pray with you, encourage you. We've got a Bible. We've got resources for you. Man, we celebrate what God's doing. Hey, church family, can I get you to look up? Hey, can we celebrate those decisions real quick? Hey, let me invite you to stand with me. You ready? In this conversation of God's will, His direction, and the decisions of life. And right now, can we make this yet again our anthem? We've sung it once, but may this be the anthem of our life as we approach.
God's will. So we say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Let's trust in Him. Oh, and I trust in God. Let's sing it out, church. You're my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Oh, let's trust Him. Yes, I trust in God. You're my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will hey, let's sing this scripture. I sought the Lord. He heard and he answered. Come on. Yeah, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard. So, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thankful that not once have you ever failed us. And we know you never will. You never break your promises, but keep them. And, Father, we desire today as your church to know, to understand, to discern your will. Knowing that more than just our pursuits, your will for our life is Jesus. Your spirit in us and living and speaking. Father, going about in a way that is a manner worthy of you, Lord. And so, Father, help the very prayer of our heart and our lips be this. Father, not my will, but yours be done. And it is our great hope that you would use our lives to bring you honor and glory that we would know the peace and the joy that Damien found on a, what was once called a God-forsaken island that, God, you did not forsake and you dearly love. Help us like Elizabeth Elliot to trust in you whose plans for us are far more than we can even wrap our minds around. So may we walk out of here trusting and obedient to your word and your will for our lives. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Connect Church online audience, for being a part of this today. Man, what a sweet time. What a timely message. Uh, Man, for so many of us in so many different areas of our life, of what it looks like to have... um, and trusting in the Lord's plan and going, God, not my will, but your will be done. And, and not just like, what's your will for my life, but just the next five minutes and being faithful to that. I mean, what a sweet time. And, and once again, we've been talking about this. For 177 straight weeks, we have seen people come to know Jesus at Connect Church. That's just since I've been here. It's been going on even before that. And, um, and maybe you're one of those today who gave your life to Jesus, one of the many who gave their life to Christ today. I mean, we want to celebrate with you. We want to, uh, we want to send you a letter, maybe even uh, give you a phone call and send you resources. Go, man, what, what does it look like for me to now follow Jesus? We want to help you in that journey as you start that. We want to celebrate with you. There's a number on the screen. If you'll text that, your first and last name, we'd love to be able to reach out to you and, and celebrate along with you because this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Uh, and maybe uh, you saw all those pictures, that last song, where it incorporated all of the baptisms from uh, Barbecue Baptism was unbelievably sweet. And I, I look at those, and I look at those moments, and, and your generosity goes to help make moments like Barbecue and Baptism happen. It seems so simple, oh, you're going to eat and have you, but so much goes into that. And you guys being faithful with your treasure and, and trust in the Lord in your giving, allow us to do things like that. And if you'd like to give to the Lord through Connect Church, 
There's three ways you can do that, online, by text, or by mail. And all those are on the screen below, and you guys can uh, feel free to do that. We're grateful for you guys. We're grateful for your continued support, and we want you to know, though you're watching online, whether you're at home and maybe some sickness or, or you watch us all the time, we are here for you. You're a part of our church family, and we love you. And if there's any way we can come alongside you as you journey towards Jesus, feel free. Reach out. DM us on social media. Maybe reach out to us on our website. We would love to get in contact with you. Connect Church Online, we love you. We're thankful for you. Live and make much of Jesus this week. Connect Church Online.